So last week we went through some installation concepts in terms of um, uh, what you might encounter um, as far as the types of walls and types of structure. Uh, I couldn't tell you everything because you know I, everything comes with experience, but I give you the most basic things and the most crucial things for now and based on which you can build your knowledge um, uh, as you go further along. Okay, uh, so now today we're going to elaborate on that uh, from the uh, perspective of tools and equipment. Okay, so let me just turn this thing on right here and there you go. Uh, control L for the uh, full screen view here. All right, so um, I'm pretty sure if, uh, you know, if when you're starting uh, either uh, your career working for some company uh, or whether you are thinking about starting your own business, uh, here's some tools you might want to consider, uh, tools and equipment. Uh, as far as um, you know, this type of uh, performing this type of work, and uh, let me tell you, over the years, you buy one by one uh, uh, things, and uh, it accumulates. Um, but uh, there are some certain basic stuff uh, that you need to uh, absolutely have, and I'm not going to mention the basic tools like side cutters, uh, you know, basic tool belt, basic screwdrivers, uh, needle nose pliers, and all that stuff. That's that's a given. Uh, you know, tape measure and things like that. So uh, that's a given you need to have. What do we have on this? Uh, I just uh, I just threw a bunch of uh, bunch of things. So let's just take a quick look at what we have here. Um, <clears throat> well, just starting from the top, uh, you will need some sort of a ladder. Okay. Um, now, probably more than one. Uh, what's a good idea to have is a kit of ladders. So if I might say kit. Um, six footer, six foot step ladder um, is your bread and butter. That's going, that's probably going to be the step ladder that you'll be using the most. Now, uh, you might also want to consider uh, getting uh, an eight foot step ladder and sometimes 10 foot step ladder as well. Uh, once upon a time, you will have to climb to those little bit higher places that six foot ladder is not going to, uh, it's just not going to be enough. Mm, and uh, also you might want to consider um, getting an extension ladder. Uh, remember from the last um, last time that we talked about ladders, an extension ladder, a 20 feet, 20 foot extension ladder is um, pretty much you're going to use at the most when it comes to that. Uh, and get uh, get some nice fiberglass ladder there. Ladders, uh, they're heavier to they're heavier to carry, but they will last longer. Plus, when you're dealing with electricity, uh, you don't really want to use the metallic aluminum ladders because of the, uh, well, the electricity um, and the conductivity thereof, uh, or conduction of electricity. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so that's as far as uh, as ladders. You might also want to get uh, something smaller as well, like uh, uh, maybe like a, you know that two foot uh, little kind of a, a small jobby. Uh, because sometimes uh, in tight spaces, when you want to just step up just a tiny bit uh, to work on uh, electrical panel or uh, security alarm panel or connecting home run, uh, you know, it just you know, you know, the six foot ladder is going to be too much in a small area, small in a small space. So you might want to get a, you know a short uh, you know, and don't get those ones, those those laundry hanging uh, ones. Get the little tiny step ladder that's made of fiberglass. Okay. Uh, uh, you're not talking about uh, we're, we're not talking about having this thing somewhere in the basement and using it maybe every two months or something. This is a ladder that you'll be using day in day out, eight hours a day. So, uh, so uh, if you get something that is um, not as rigid, uh, first uh, it's going to get used uh, pretty quick, and you're going to have to keep buying those. Um, and uh, the other thing is, uh, if you're using it so heavily, um, as you use it, this thing might deteriorate before you know it, and uh, you're going to put yourself in danger of, uh, of maybe falling down from it because of, because of the equipment failure. Right? And how high do you have to be uh, in order to hurt yourself when you fall down? Uh, we went over that some time ago. Well, you could be sitting in a chair and uh, can fall off of it and you can hurt yourself. So there's no there's no downward limit uh, when it comes to heights. All right. So here is as far as ladder, uh, drill, uh, cordless drill. Uh, well, 
you might want to get a couple of drills, or well, maybe more than a couple of drills. Just a cordless drill uh, that uh, that is uh, that you can use it as a drill, basic drill, and you can use it as a mechanical screwdriver because a lot of uh, a lot of times you're going to encounter situations that you're going to have to put in a lot of screws, and uh, doing it by hand, it, it, you, know, you you can get some uh, uh, prolonged use uh, type of a repetitive action uh, injury uh, in your in your hands, and you're going to be using your hands for your work. So you might want to take care of your hands. Uh, so uh, so a lot of times you're going to use that drill as a screwdriver as well. Just put screwdriver bits in it, and uh, and there you go. If you have to do 20 screws, you're not going to uh, uh, you're going to work with your hand and just like that screwdriver and just keep going with that. Right? So so that also you might want to get a cordless hammer drill. Right? The difference between the just a regular drill and the hammer drill is that the regular drill. Um, is uh, basically has the rotary motion and that's it. It puts the drill bit in the spin and uh, you can go into things like wood or you know soft uh, you know soft softer than concrete okay um, or steel. Uh, so um, uh, but if you want to get into a uh, something harder like a concrete, okay uh, then uh, you might want to use something like a hammer hammer drill. Okay, uh, so yeah, sorry, there is a bit of a background noise. We just have to bear with that. Okay, uh, so the difference between the regular drill and the hammer drill, hammer drill not only has the rotary motion that puts the drill bit into a spin, but it also has an impact, uh, a repetitive kind of vibra vibratory motion impact, and it, it, that's why it's called a hammer drill. So if you want to get into a concrete slab to drill a, to drill an opening. Uh, then um, uh, the uh, just a regular drill is not going to be enough. Uh, you can if you you know if you're in a pinch and if you have nothing else, uh, it's been done. You might want, you might kind of just get it a bit longer, but you're going to overheat the drill bit and but eventually you're going to get the hole done, right? But uh, but the hammer drill uh, is uh, something definitely. If you're drilling into a brick or if you're drilling into a concrete, you might want to get yourself a hammer drill. Okay, and that's also a good idea to have a cordless, and uh, it's also a good idea to have just a regular electric drill that you plug in. On a construction site, you can't afford the downtime because your battery uh, just went down on you or something like that. So, um, uh, uh, and sometimes you're going to get uh, some more heavy drilling with uh, multiple holes and. Um, the battery might just not be enough, okay? Even though you're going to have a charger and another battery in the charger uh, waiting for you to be to be changed. So sometimes uh, the, the heavier regular hammer drill is good. Then uh, we can get into some sort of uh, heavier hammer drills like a Hilti gun, but that's for, for drilling some heavier stuff. And we're going to talk about some of that, uh, things that you can possibly use to mount. All right, um, uh, so drills, uh, yeah, so see, it, it adds up, okay? Um, things do add up, uh, but you don't buy things uh, at, at once. You just, uh, just a regular, for, 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 the, for, for starts, I would just get like a regular cordless hammer drill. Okay. And the, you know there are some different brands that have that have good um, um, good action. If you're interested in getting some quality equipment, and you really want if you're if you're using it for your home use, uh, you know it's going to be sitting in your basement, and once in every two months or six months, you're going to have to hang a picture or something. Yeah, okay, uh, you know the, the you can just get something from just a regular kind of a store, you know. Uh, you know, good good deal, as they, as they say. Right? Uh, but uh, but when you come when it comes to um, uh, using it professionally um, on a regular basis to make living out of it, uh, it's going to be a heavy use. Then you might want to get some quality tools. And uh, uh, I'm just I just don't want because I'm posting this thing on YouTube. I don't want to mention some brands uh, for whatever reason. But uh, if you're uh, if you're interested um, uh, in, in, rec in in some good brands or good models. Uh, just talk to me. I'll recommend some some uh, good sources for you. All right. So that's as far as drills. Okay. Uh, the next thing, uh, regular multimeter. Uh, so that's also a given. It's a good idea also to have uh, the, instead of DMM. Well, DMM is uh, is good. 
but sometimes once in a while you might want to use some sort of analog uh, meter that uh, that's uh, with a needle and needle pointer uh, because sometimes when you when you try to look at some fluctuations in voltage uh, you know phone line ringing or whatever um, you might want so that one you can get like a nice cheap one uh, and you can just have it stashed uh, somewhere but uh, dmm uh, most of definitely you're going to have to have right then there is the data tester uh, that we have here okay uh, data tester mm, well in some of the data testers you might spend thousand dollars or close to sometimes even two thousand dollars and this is something that's called a data uh, tester uh, Ethernet type or whatever cable qualifier. Okay, so uh, um, so it is going to check for the wire mapping. It's going to check for the length of the run, and it's going to perform some light duty um, signal uh, response testing. Okay. Um, so for the most part, you 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 will get away with that. Um, and uh, as far as that, also um, at some point, you might need something like um, a certifier. Okay, and certifier uh, goes through way more uh, rigorous tests as frequency response, uh, crosstalk, um, attenuation, and many other aspects of the just to just to make sure that the the link fulfills the specifications of cat 5e or cat 6 or cat 6a or whatnot all right so uh, um, now that thing cause plus also it has a, uh, there's a possibility of attaching um, the uh, front end uh, dies um, so you can attach a die that is going to test for uh, for coaxial cable Right. And you can attach a die uh, that is going to accommodate uh, Ethernet cables. Uh, you can attach a die that is going to, it's going to accommodate optical fiber tests. All right. So uh, those uh, those run somewhere well about ten thousand dollars, sometimes less if you get a, if you can get a better deal, maybe get a used one. But um, well, you usually need those for bigger jobs, uh, for uh, for some more. And I apologize for using that term, serious clients, because every client is serious. Uh, right, but uh, some of the bigger institutions, they require certification. So every run that you install has to be certified and you need a certifier for that. And those have run anywhere between seven and $10,000, $15,000, okay? But the thing is about that, when you get a bigger job like that, uh, you, first, you might be able to afford to buy that if you keep getting jobs like this, or you can rent one, okay? There are places you can rent those things for a day or two. Okay? <clears throat> So that's as far as uh, testing equipment. Um, some diagnostic equipment as well. Uh, over here, we see something like a toner, okay? Uh, toner here's, consists of like a toner kit or tone injector kit. It consists of tone generator device and a probe, right? With the tone generator device, you clip onto the, into a pair of wires, a pair, and then you introduce a tone, and it's just sometimes you can you can select between a constant tone, it's just gonna be really annoying, one kilohertz beep, you know, uh, or sometimes uh, less annoying, uh, it's going to sound like ti da di da di da di da. Okay, it's uh, it's it's a little bit better to distinguish from the whole floor noise. Um, so <clears throat> uh, you put that on to the pair. And you go on the other side and you look for that pair. Let's say it could be on a Bix block or on the patch panel. Uh, if the wires are not labeled and you really need to find where this wire is uh, that is from the jack in the wall, where it ends up in the home run location in the patch panel or, or termination block, uh, it's, um, it's a must have device. It runs about $100 or so, maybe a little bit more now with the fuel prices that are going up. All right, it's a must have thing, right? The way you also use it is just you, you clip on the pair 
and you and you seek with the probe uh, the approximate location of that and uh, and when you when you run your probe close to that pair where it's going to be on a termination block of course the noise or the signal is going to get stronger and then just to make sure that you get that proper pair because there could be a bleed through from another pair uh, you, you, you clip onto that pair with something that's called a uh, sometimes well, for Bix, so it's going to be a Bix clip, or you can uh, clip on, uh, you can make yourself a jig, which would be a RG45 on one end, and then just a bare wire on the other end, and uh, you were just going to short the blue pair, and once you short the blue pair, it, the signal should disappear because you're shorting it, right? So, uh, so then you're going to make sure that this is the one that that pair that uh, is plugged into the other side in the wall. If the tone doesn't disappear, there are two options. One is that it's a bleed through from another pair. So you're gonna you know, maybe the jack beside it, left or right. Or um, there's the, the other worst possibility is, is that uh, one of the wires is broken. So shorting it uh, is not going to make the tone disappear. Right? Shorting the pair. Uh, in the background here, I've included some basic screwdrivers, but that also goes for everything else that you have, uh, just the basic tools uh, that you're, you're going to use. And you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to establish your own arsenal, if I may say that, of things. Right. As far as also data, it's a quick data checker right here. Those you can pick up uh, for some, you know, some online stores or electrical stores or whatever, uh, or even hardware stores. You can pick up relatively cheap. You can get one for maybe 40 bucks, 60 bucks. Uh, that uh, you plug in our, uh, the Ethernet cable on one end and you plug it in on the other end. The, uh, so there's two, uh, there's two um, separatable devices. One, you take it in the field, plug it into the wall through a patch, through a patch cable, and then you use another patch cable to plug in the other uh, main, um, the main brains, if you can say it, uh, to the other side. And it's just going to check for the wire map. Um, it's a quick, quick and dirty kind of a test. Uh, Plug it in, plug it in, press the button, wire map is okay, all right? So, uh, but that's by no means, it's a qualifier, it by no means it is a, um, a certifier, all right? But it's a, it's a nice quick thing so to, to do a quick test if, uh, if, 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 if just to make sure that at least the wire mapping is okay and the connections are okay. All right, uh, in the background here, we can see, uh, I've just included one here, but you're going to accommodate a bunch of punch down tools. Right, and uh, the most uh, the most thing that you're going to use is going to be the 110 punch down tool. 110 is your bread and butter. The other bread and butter is going to be the Bix punch down tool. If you got these two, you're good. 66, uh, you can use the punch down tool, but you're not going to be dealing with 66 blocks that much. Uh, but uh, but some of those. Uh, mm, when you buy a punch down tool, you get few heads uh, supplied. So maybe you can get one common punch down tool, the, uh, the, the, the main handle of it, uh, the main body of it, and you can just replace the heads uh, on that. If, you, if you're using Bix, uh, you're gonna, gonna put Bix head on it. And if you're using 110, you're gonna put 110 on it and so on, All right? Um, now, right beside here, a little bit to the left, we have something that's called a fish tape. Right. What do we use the fish tape? It's a it's a steel um, it's a steel tape um, that is rolled up into a, into a bundle, and uh, you can get some shorter ones, uh, maybe forty footers, sixty footers, hundred feet is probably towards the longest ones, uh, because you know to be honest. Uh, you can you can you can you can shove the fish line into a uh, conduit. And uh, if it gets more than 100 feet, um, you can keep pushing it and it's going to start binding on you, right? So uh, up to 100 feet is probably the most practical solution for the fish tape. Uh, what do we use that for? We, well, uh, if it's a half inch conduit or, you know, quarter inch, not quarter inch, half inch conduit, three quarter inch conduit, one inch conduit, you can put in that fish tape and it's going to come out on the other side, wherever the other end is. And uh, we grab the other end uh, as, you, as you unroll that from this roll. Um, and then you can attach a wire or cable to it and you can pull it back with the cable or you can uh, attach a string to it, uh, the twine string that, uh, that you can, um, you know, because sometimes installing conduit raceways, 
the contract is going to call for stringing them. All right. So uh, you might you might have a request of installing a conduit, and they all have to be strung. What that means is that every single conduit is going to have a string in it. So uh, if somebody wants to pull the wires through it, they have that string already provided uh, for you. Right. Now the fish tapes um, they um, they classify as steel fish tapes or fiberglass fish tapes. The steel is more rigid. Um, the, fi the, uh, the fiberglass one is, um, well, a little bit softer, but uh, it's more practical when you have some already existing cables in the conduit. Um, if you put in a fish tape, you might damage the wires. If you put in a steel fish tape, you might damage those wires. But if you put a fiberglass, uh, the fiberglass is going to go a little bit smoother. It's going to weave itself uh, through those wires that are already there. And um, and it's not going to be as, well, it can damage everything with anything, but uh, the ch it, it greatly lessens the chances of you damaging the wires um, um, while, you're, while you're moving that fish tape inside the conduits with some already existing wires in it. Also, what I would suggest, there are different lubricants that uh, you're going to put on that fish tape, uh, because if this is, you know, if it's a 50, 60, 70 foot, 70 feet length of the conduit with some wires in it, you can only push that thing so far and then the friction is going to work against you, right? So lube is... Uh, uh, it's going to work for you big time, all right? And those electrical uh, stores, the electrical supplier stores, hardware stores, or otherwise distributors, they sell uh, wire pulling lube, okay? Now, uh, when you're going to use lubricant, use the lube that is designed for wire pulling. Uh, I said that uh, last term, and I'm going to say it again. Try not to use, because uh, there was a, um, sometimes you can see, uh, somebody just, you know, okay, didn't get the lube, so uh, let's get some soapy water or, you know, get some soap or liquid soap and, and put that on. Uh, try not, try to avoid that at all costs, uh, because uh, what happens is that you don't know the chemical consistency of the soap that you, that is going to, that, that you have it at hand. Uh, and once you introduce that into that closed raceway, which would be a conduit, that thing is going to stay there and you don't know if the chemical the chemicals that in that soap are they going to work against that jacketing and maybe going, they're going to damage the wires or not it's not going to happen overnight but uh, with time you might uh, be actually damaging the wires right uh, so uh, that also what i have included here is the um uh, fiberglass rods fiberglass rods they come in six foot lengths and they have a female thread on one end and on the other end of this one is going to be a, just, a, just a male end of, of just a thread, okay? And you can cascade them together. Uh, if you're, you can put those in, the, um, you can use those while fishing down the walls because they're nice and straight. Um, you can uh, put them in, the, you, can, you can use them uh, with the cable trays and otherwise raceways um, uh, and you can just cascade them together so uh, if, if it's like a maybe a 60 foot length or something or maybe a well not six well, yeah, something like that so so you can you can you can get uh, you know i mean six foot length i think it's also 10 feet length uh, uh, but six foot lengths are, are more practical because it's, you can store it and throw it in the car um, so uh, go to hardware store, any hardware store, um, some of the bigger ones, they will have those. They're also not cheap, you know, it's about $100. Everything is about $100. Although, you know what, within the last few months, uh, prices might go up, right? And they have different attachments uh, in order to go through certain type of, uh, of um, you know, so you can see a little bit of hook. Of course, you're not going to put in a hook uh, inside the pipe with uh, with other wires, but you might want to put a hook uh, when you're trying to fish the wall, the, the wire inside the wall or something, right? Um, then there's some other wire attachments there to uh, to push those to, to to be able to push those wire uh, that fiberglass rod in some tight tighter spaces. 
with more turns, uh, depending on what works. Some of them have attachments and sometimes you're going to make your own attachments to it and you're gonna tape them right too. This one has a little bit of a chain also attached to it. So um, uh, when you're fishing wires down the wall and you have an opening on the bottom and you shove this thing from the top, you can have a little bit of a telescopic magnet and you can put that into the opening and that is going to catch that chain, all right? Uh, so that, um, and uh, what else do we have here? Uh, basic drill bits. I just put that basic drill bit um, uh, kind of a picture here, um, because basic drill bit kit, but you're going to have sometimes um, in some specialized uh, situations, you're going to need some specialized type of drill bits, uh, you know, and, and there are different ones. So, so as you go along, uh, you're going to accommodate more and more, but you're going to buy things one by one. And uh, before you know it, in two or three years, you're going to go, oh, wow, I got so many tools right now. Eh? Uh, so then uh, <clears throat> I put a laptop on here. Laptop is going to also be your... Um, go to tool. Uh, quite often when you go to service calls, you're going to have on the paperwork that you're going to be provided by whoever sends you there, you're going to have a phone number to call. Uh, let's say, for example, there's going to be some adjustment needed to maybe a gateway uh, or a switch that has to be done locally. So you're going to have a um, laptop with the Ethernet cord. Most of the equipment right now pretty much has the Ethernet jacks through which the equipment can be configured. Sometimes you're going to have something that's called a console port. So uh, write it down, all right? Uh, get yourself a console cable, right? Because the console jack, it, uh, it reminds the, uh, it, it looks very, very similar. If you look at it from far, you, it, you'll think it's RJ45 jack, just an Ethernet jack. All right, but it's actually a console. It's a little bit wider. Uh, um, and of course, the pinout of the cable is a little bit different. And uh, quite often it goes through something that's called a serial port on, the, on your laptop or computer. So um, there used to be pretty much all of the laptops would have a serial port um, as part of the motherboard. But uh, now uh, the equipment is being sold without those serial ports. So also write it down. You might want to get yourself something that's called a serial interface. A serial interface has RS-232 jack on one end. It usually comes in the box uh, configuration. And on the other side of it, it's going to have a USB uh, cable. Right, so that USB you plug into a USB port into uh, into your laptop, and then uh, the other one is going to have well uh, RJ45 or a console um, type of a, but it's a console interface. So you're talking about a completely different thing, right? So um, uh, console cable is one thing that you need. Uh, serial interface for your laptop, and some longer. RJ45, remember you know, we made those patch cords? You might want to make yourself uh, sometimes, I mean, maybe even a hundred footer cable, because sometimes when you go with your laptop and you need to configure some uh, some stuff and you're going to be having a phone number provided. So you're going to get yourself laptop set up uh, in that, uh, whatever the land room is, plug it in, call that number, and they will tell you how to log into that piece of equipment. And they'll tell you step-by-step step on the phone what to do and you don't even need to know how that equipment works they will be telling you on the phone uh basically step-by-step -step instructions of uh, what to do with that uh, very very common thing uh, especially on the service calls all right page number two all right so uh as just as a reminder of what uh, uh of what we did last time we took care of something that's called the project stages, right? And uh, I classified them as survey, assessment, site work, commissioning, and billing, right? And we'll go, uh, we'll analyze uh, those one by one. And uh, through this and the next lecture, we're going to concentrate mostly on the site work as far as, as, far as tools, because um, uh, in this class, I'm getting ready to be uh, service technicians. Okay, so, uh, so that's going to be the main area that we'll concentrate on. However, 
sometimes, especially if you decide to go on a business for your own, you have to know what all these um, um, basically have to do with. Okay? All right, so let's talk about survey. Right? As we talked about that before, a survey is an inspection, and I'm going to read that thing. So it's an inspection of an area where work is planned. Type of the site survey and the best practices required depend on the nature of the project. Okay, so it's a bit of a definition here. Survey is uh, you go on site and you are assessing the site of what needs to be done, what you're up against, is there any equipment that needs to be upgraded? Is there any equipment that needs to be replaced? Is there any equipment that needs to be added? Especially wires, all right? And uh, wires and switches. Um, so, and you're going to take a look at other equipment depending on what the project is. So if you are switching a, a telephone system from the uh, conventional to VoIP telephone system, you're going to have to look at connections, you're going to have to look at the wiring, you're going to have to look at the switches, you're going to have to look at the PA system. Uh, what does it need for the PA system, the existing PA system to be connected uh, to, uh, uh, to the new phone system that is going to be, and usually it's going to be through a paging interface and ATA adapter. Um, and you're going to look at some other things, um, like uh, if there's some other wires that need to be added or, or, or replaced, you're going to look at some possible um, ways to run those wires. Are there any obstacles? Are there any serious problems? Are there any, you know, sometimes is there some different equipment that needs to be rented, for example, or utilized, like, for example, uh, there's some high places that you need to get into. Do you need a boom lift? Do you need a scissor lift? Things like that. So you make all those notes. Uh, and uh, based on that, you are going to quote for the project and tell the client what it will take to, to, to basically carry, carry through with this project. And, um, and based on that, you're going to be doing the pricing on that, right? So what do you need for that? Um, well, uh, just a, a regular thing. You need yourself, you need a notepad, camera because you're going to take a lot of pictures and okay survey sometimes as i said before it can take an hour it can take two hours sometimes it can take a week depending on the size of the project okay uh you're going to take, you know get some sort of a measuring distance measuring equipment so uh, measuring tape is uh, the basic thing uh, there are some of those wheelie things that you can wheel to do the distance and sometimes you can have some gadgets like laser pointers that uh, calculate the distance and whatnot you need to sometimes you need to know the distances uh, of course, uh, basic screwdriver kit because uh, sometimes you have to open some panels to look what's inside. Um, flashlight, you need flashlight, okay? You need a bit of a ladder, a bit of a ladder, all right? Because sometimes you need to take a you know, step up and take a closer look at some things that are higher. And you will need the PPE, uh, safety glasses, hard hat, uh, safety boots. Because sometimes when you're going to work into some production halls and stuff like that, you, you will not be able to uh, even enter that. So get yourself ready so you look professional to the client uh, when you show up on site. You know, wear nice clean clothes, get a good haircut and all that stuff. All that counts, all right? And of course, you're going to need the knowledge. Nobody is going to send you to, to do a survey just after hiring, one, within one week of hiring you. Uh, people who do the surveys are usually people who have worked in the business for a few years and they know exactly what to look for so they can get a proper survey uh, notes to whoever is going to be estimating that. Whether it be you, if it's your own business, or whether it's going to be someone else in the office that, uh, of the company that you work for. Right? And here's a little notepad, right? nice and yellow. Okay, uh, assessment. Well, uh, assessment part of it, it's basically making a quote. It's pricing the job. So that's after the survey, based on the survey notes, they're going to do assessment. So it comes for pricing, evaluation, esti estimate, uh, all the estimate type of documentation. Right? Um, and that the whole thing is going to come down to a quote. Right? Um, what do you need? Well, you need, to, uh, you need to have a network of suppliers because you need to know where the equipment you're going to be getting from, comes from. Um, you need the prices for the equipment. 
you need some sort of office setup because you need a computer and all the software. So you need to be able to use, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a word processor or some sort of a um, spreadsheet program or whatnot, all right? And of course, you need some knowledge uh, to, to get a proper quote. If it's a small job and if you misprice it, uh, you might lose 200 bucks, okay? maybe $500, okay? And then you just go, okay, I have learned my lesson. Like, but if it's a huge job that it's, you know, uh, that is going to, the whole bill to the client is going to be $200,000. And if you misprice that, then you might uh, find yourself that you lose $50,000 and that's not a happy situation, okay? So knowledge is important, of course, but in order to price that, you gotta have that knowledge and knowledge comes with the experience, okay? Uh, <clears throat> side work. This is what we're going to uh, concentrate um, ourselves on uh, through this and through the next lecture. So I just said that it's continued on the following pages and we're going to start up with that today. All right, so uh, site works, uh, installation or service, or service. Okay, so sometimes you're going, to, uh, uh, you're going to be required to perform a brand new installation. And sometimes you're going to be sent to service calls uh, because something stopped working and you need to um, make it work again. Right? It broke, can you make it work again? Right? I used to, I remember uh, when I used to, used to work in the field uh, years ago uh, and I was installing and servicing uh, a lot of telephone systems. Uh, I knew that, uh, for, especially in summertime, if there's a storm at night, I knew I was going to have a lot of service calls in the morning because uh, there's always some sort, some lightning hits somewhere close to by some building, especially in the countryside area, uh, that uh, a lot of those phone systems would be uh, uh, would be offline, uh, knocked out of line. Right. So uh, I knew, uh, I knew that I was bracing myself. If there's a storm at night, I was bracing myself for a lot of service calls the next day. And uh, you know, uh, in business environment, the phone system goes down. But that was um, that was before. If you can imagine that, uh, <laughs> makes me feel old a little bit. Not really. Um, <clears throat> that was before the cell phones were um, so widely implemented. So the cell phones just kicked off relatively not too long ago. All right. So, uh, so there was a time that, yeah, some people would have cell phones, some people wouldn't. Uh, so the phone system would, was a huge part of running the business. And can you imagine now uh, there's, you know, Tuesday morning and the phones don't work. That means uh, the clients want, are unable to reach you. Uh, that means uh, possibly that you're losing money, all right? So, so when I had a six service calls uh, in the morning uh, to service some of the phone systems, I knew I just had to brace myself and do them fast and efficient. So I would just load up as much equipment as I can, as much replacement equipment as I can, as I think of uh, you, know, uh, you know whatever I had, and I would just go in the field and service, 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 quick, 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 and then you know, at the end of the day I would just go, ah, take a deep breath. Okay, done it. All right. So um, now commissioning, commissioning is um, also part of doing the project. Okay. What is it? It's basically a presentation and training. Training is part of the commissioning. When, when you install a new system uh, to whatever company, so let's say it's a brand new telephone system. Yeah, okay, if it's, it's a phone, just a regular phone used to be like, you know, big bakelite black phone on somebody's desk and all it had it was a handset and a dial uh, to dial, there was not much to train because everybody knew how to use the phone. But now if it comes to using a phone system, uh, in, it's what's involved in the phone system. It's transferring calls. It's a certain type of a setup that is characteristic to this particular model or this particular model and the setup, the way it's, it's done. Uh, so um, uh, you, need to, you need to train the receptionist on how to use this particular system to transfer the calls to the conference calls and to how to retrieve the voicemail and all that stuff. And then you need to uh, train the, 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 all the facility management uh, and, uh, and whoever is going to be using that phone. So, uh, you know, you designate the whole day on that, uh, just the training, all right? And then um, uh, commissioning, you know, it's basically presenting the system. Here's the system. 
this is what you used to have, this is what you have now, um, and maybe there's some, you're going to present the whole thing of nice, you know, what, what the features are, how they work, and maybe there's going to be some, uh, you know, some questions from, from, from the clients. Uh, uh, so I'm going to answer that, you know, Q and I, Q and I type, right? Um, so that's part of the commissioning, uh, especially when you, when well, pretty much every system that uh, that you install, unless if, uh, it's uh, unless it is a um, let's say a chain, it's a certain type of a company, and they have a bunch of stores uh, all over North America. Well, Tim Hortons would be one, for example, um, or some other places, and uh, and and. So you, you don't need to, because everything is a cookie cutter type of a thing. Uh, you set it up, people who are working there, they already know how to use that, okay? Because it's a basically a repetitive kind of a system going on, right? Uh, all right, so for that, you need you, you need the audience, and you need some sort of a conference room or something like that, depending on the situation, right? And then the last thing, which was my favorite part, and when everything is done nicely, comes the billing right so i just put some uh, a bunch of money handed to you for the job that you have done um of course uh part of the commissioning or or, or part of the well it falls in anywhere from commissioning to billing and the end of the installation is going to be the deliverables right so uh, but we spend so much time on the deliverables it's a given you need to go to work to uh, mount a shelf, you will need a screwdriver. Uh, it's it's a given that once you perform it, that I perform any type of installation or service calls, a service call, you're going to need to uh, provide the deliverables, and uh, we are doing them all the time. Every single lab, you're doing them, so you're, you're getting into the habit. What I am happy to see. Uh, right now is that sometimes or quite often most of the time actually uh, when uh, when when people are coming to the lab right so I'm doing a little bit setup gathering the equipment to give to give to you um, and I can see people sit down and they start filling out the deliverable equipment uh, pre-doing that uh, so that's you know what that's a good good this is exactly what I wanted to see because that's what you will be doing and you're getting into a habit of doing that and this is that means that's going to be just that so much easier for you later on once you go to work right it's all about the habit and then of course uh, billing what you can use the money for well they can use the money to <laughs> to buy that island that you always wanted or you can buy yourself a car that you always wanted or you can invest in more tools so you can do more work so you can get more money <laughs> all right so uh as i said the fur the the uh this this is the furthest slides uh these are these are the further slide slides uh as far as the site work and we're going to start on it and we're going to continue next uh, next time we see each other so site work remember rough in and we're talking about uh the tools that now you're going to need and we're going to expand on that uh, as we go along. So uh, just as a reminder, roughing in. After planning the cable distribution, the rough in stage begins. Again, after planning the cable distribution, the rough in stage begins. Planning the cable distribution, what does that mean? It means that the survey, uh, you get the office layout or the building layout, and you mark, here's going to be a telephone jack. Here's going to be a data jack. Here's going to be five data jacks. Here's going to be wireless access point. You, you, you mark it on and during the survey, you're going to, um, you're going to make your notes that maybe there's some sort of uh, you know, uh, obstacle that you're going to have to go around that. So all that stuff. So, so then uh, after you have all that knowledge, then you are going to be able to go to the site to work properly. You're going to know exactly what you'll be doing. You will know exactly what tools you need. You know exactly what equipment you need, especially if you need some taller ladders or maybe, excuse me, maybe you're going to need some, uh, some lifting uh, equipment uh, like lifts. Uh, scissor lifts or boom lifts. These are the most, or men lifts uh, sometimes, okay? Uh, so uh, for that also you need some licensing licensing for that uh, and uh, most of the rental equipment places they are they provide training it might cost you 400 500 dollars to get uh, working on heights ticket 
it might cost you about 400 500 dollars to get your training on the uh, to get the lift ticket and i think it's uh, right now when when you get trained you get something up to 180 feet up uh, equipment right and uh, it's money well spent because the knowledge will save your life right so um uh, okay so when in that uh, in that stage um what do they write here all cables are pulled from the home run location to their destinations that's a pretty much given uh self-explanatory uh, the cables are coiled in bundles at both ends, but not terminated. So I just a little a little picture here. Here's an office environment, for example, and these are the, that's basically what it looks like, right? So these are cables that are being pulled, and they can, you know they could be in a tray or whatever raceway. And I put a little J hook right here, and we'll uh, uh, we'll expand on that. So this is a J hook that is supporting the wires, bunch of them every four feet, no further than four feet, right? Uh, so uh, what I say, make sure that all cables are clearly identified at both ends. So that's the uh, rough end stage. Uh, all runs are securely mounted in the ceiling space or otherwise raceways. And the work is done accor in a, uh, according to the local building and electrical code, right? So, um, and there's a bunch of cables that's what it looks like and sometimes you get a bunch of boxes sometimes you get a bunch of wheels uh if you get reels you might want to get the real stand for that because you're not going to just put it on the ground and uncoil it by hand uh you need some you need some uh um real stands uh, what do they look like it's usually it's a it's some sort of a uh, stand here with a with a pipe on it and that's where you put your reels on all right and uh, you get those wires, bundle them up, and as you pull, the wheels unroll, okay? So that's basically what, uh, what, the, what the real stand is, um, if you're using reels, okay? Next is slider, please, all right? Site work continuing, rough in tools and equipment structures, pathways and raceways. Cable installation begins with establishing the pathways. And sometimes it's, it's a treacherous work because you're going to have to look Having the drawings is one thing. Um, some preliminary um, survey is going to give you a lot, uh, a lot of knowledge of what you're up against. But then as the project continues, there are other trades that are in the building and they will be have, you will be having electricians, plumbers, uh, air duct people, um, painters, um, drywallers, whatnot. So sometimes um, things can be fluid, they can change, uh, they can change on you overnight, all right? So, um, uh, so the, uh, the, the establishing the pathways is important, okay? So once you, uh, remember last time I said the best way, the best window of opportunity for us to lay the wires in is before the drywall or otherwise structure is being put in that's going to block your uh, your access to the walls to the inside of the walls so before that but after the air ducts are in and sometimes it's more possible than others but uh, try to aim for that kind of a timing okay uh, so free air runs right main runs should be kept in bundles and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. So basically, basically, again, I keep, I keep using the word basically. I apologize for that. Yes. So if you have a home run um, communication room in one space, right? so all the wires are going to come in, come out of that through the ceiling. Try not to run the one. No, don't, we're not going to run the wires one by one as it goes. We're going to have, like, for example, from here to the other side of the hallway, uh, there is going to be a bunch of cables going in, and then they're going to fan out to different rooms. So you're going to have to keep them in the bundle as far as possible, and then you're going to fan them out, right? So that's, that's what I say. Uh, and they are supposed to, the wires are supposed to be suspended independently of any structure. Like for example, ceiling, the drop ceiling grid. What's a drop ceiling grid? There is a floor, there is the space that basically people are in, and then there's a ceiling, usually the ceiling tiles in the commercial environment. And the ceiling tiles are suspended on a wire grid 
that's suspended by the wires. And the wires are attached to the true ceiling. Usually it's a concrete slab, usually. Right? Uh, sometimes other things. Uh, so you're going to have sometimes a foot, sometimes 10 feet, sometimes 20 feet of the ceiling space. Right? Depends on the, again, all depends on the situation. Right? Now, it used to be some time ago that uh, people would just go and suspend those, uh, those wires, attaching them to the wires that hold the ceiling tiles. That is a no-no right now. Okay? Uh, one of the main reasons is the fire regulations. Right? And you can look at some of the uh, code and, uh, you know, um, but I'm not teaching you code. We're not we're talking about code here, but I'm just gonna give you the, the, the general idea of, of what this is. Uh, if you if you attach a bunch of wires and everything, everybody else is going to attach a bunch of whatever they attach to the ceiling structure. Uh, if there's a fire, the fire crews, the firemen, the women, are going to go on the side, and sometimes they need to tear things down using their hooks on the sticks, whatever they, those are called, uh, and uh, and they need to be able to do it nice and easy, right? But if there's a bunch of things attached to that ceiling structure, that puts them in danger. So that's that's one of the main reasons why, uh, you know, why the wires are, you know, so don't don't suspend your wires from the ceiling structure. Uh, you got to you gotta put them on the walls and you're going to use something that's called the J-hooks or you're going to use uh, cable trays or other raceways. Uh, maybe uh, you're going to have to install uh, EMT piping uh, or PVC piping as well. Okay. Almost done. Right. So uh, again, as I said, free air runs, right? I'm gonna read it again. Main runs should be kept in bundles and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. As much as possible, establish straight runs. So pulling multiple cables can be done efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, you know you're going to um, uh, you're going to establish if there's a room, uh, and if you if you pop the tile and look in the ceiling, sometimes there's going to be obstacles, so you won't be able to just go as you please. But you're going to look and look and look and find as many straight lines as possible. What is the easiest way of doing that is to run a string. So uh, you're going to use the glass, the fiberglass rods and tie a string to it. And you're going to try to push that fiberglass rod as far as you can go. And that is going to establish a straight run. Okay, then you just pull that with string on it and you attach the string to the ceiling or some sort of a structure uh, and, and, and kind of uh, make it snag, right? So it's going to be straight. And based on that, you're going to ride, that's going to be a guide for mounting some, that's called a J-hook supports. And J-hooks, we'll talk about what it is. So this wire support, whatever it's going to be, is it going to, is it going to be some piping or is it going to be? Uh, so then as, as you establish those, for example, J-hooks, you can run a string through those. And then you can attach a bundle of wires, maybe sometimes 15 or 20, well, 20 is a lot, but sometimes six or 10 or 12. And you can use that one string to pull that in a straight line. That's what that's what I mean by having uh, by by establishing straight lines, so you can do it efficiently. And if you have to do more and more and more, uh, it's going to make a job going that much faster. Yeah. Um, uh, raceways. So they are free air runs, or they are enclosed wires in the, in, in the closed raceways. Uh, as the alternative to the free air method, closed raceways or cable trays are used. All the raceways should be installed before the cables are run. Uh, hint, position the J-hooks no further than four feet apart to avoid cable snagging. And sometimes it's actually, uh, sometimes it's actually included in the contract. And when you want the J-hooks to suspend the wires, right? Mount the J-hooks to suspend the wires. Here's a J-hook, here's a J-hook, here's a J-hook, here's a J-hook, and so on. And they are going to be supporting the wires. Right? Uh, no more than four feet apart here. 
Because if you put them further, the cables are going to snag. And that's also not good because it presents too much tension in that point. And it's actually, uh, it's uh, almost like pretty much like squeezing the cable when you have too much tension on this. Yeah. Uh, all right, so it's three minutes to go. Um, there are a couple more slides uh, in this presentation. That's what J-hooks look like. But you know what? We're going to pick it up uh, next time we see each other. Uh, because as I say, I don't want to rush through it. I, I need to explain things to you as much as possible. Uh, so even though you're not doing the practical aspect of this work, because the project-based learning would be the best, but uh, what we have here is uh, it's a different setup. Uh, so uh, I just need to give you as much as much explanation as possible. And sometimes I'll try to give you the real life examples uh, and I have lots of them, all right? So uh, uh, cool. All right, so uh, our labs and mine going to be posted. Yeah, you have the videos right now for the labs nine and 10. So watch that. All the information that you need is there. And I'm going to, right after this lecture, I'm going to post, because this is the beginning of the week, I am going to post the printed sheets for that. But even if you don't have them, uh, the videos that you're going to watch, that, that all the information that's there, it's like for the last two or three weeks, uh, it's already posted there, okay? But yes, I'm going to set this up and I'm going to set up the rubrics and the submission boxes. All right. All right, guys. So this is it for today and we'll pick it up uh, next time we see each other. Thank you very much. I'll see you when I see you.